It's great to see you today here at the Victorville campus. We have folks joining us, Apple Valley and Phelan as well, and just grateful you're a part of High Desert Church and with us today. It's been a great day already. You watch that video and coming out of it, you're like, ooh, what is this all about? We are in a year-long series called Route 66, and we have just finished a series in uh, the Old Testament on leadership, and now we move into the books of poetry. Now we're talking this, uh, we're subsetting this, um, we're calling it Life Uncensored, and looking at just the, the emotions and the passions that are expressed in Scripture, our hearts are going to resonate with them. One thing that will help you today as we dive into this first message in this series is a set of the notes. So if you didn't get a copy on the way in, if you'd want to ask someone, just raise your hand and we'll have some folks get those to you. Love to have those so you can uh, just kind of dial in and be a little bit more with us. If you'll notice, if you have your notes, look on the back. And you'll notice that usually those are small group questions. For the summer, a lot of our small groups take a break. So what we've done instead is that for your daily reading on Route 66, our pastors are going to take turns and just basically put in a devotional thought for each day or a question, something to kind of think about this as you read these three or four chapters today. So uh, it'll be helpful to you hopefully in the journey and uh, just continue one, one step closer to what God wants for us in this great uh, trek that we're on together. So we're just so glad you're here. My name's Todd, one of the pastors here. We dive into this first uh, topic today on this new um, series. The idea of poetry to me is just fascinating. Uh, doubtless you have some sort of book you're reading right now. Maybe it's an electronic version. Maybe it's a paperback or a hardback. Maybe sitting next to your bedside table. And you're reading that as you uh, get up in the morning, go to bed at night, whatever. But I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not a book of poetry. Just going to fill your mind with the arts, you know, before you, uh, before you go to bed tonight. So poetry is a genre that we aren't usually in a lot of on our own. And that's what's fascinating to me about the Bible, among other things, is that God uses this form of literature to express himself to us, even as we get to express ourselves to him. Throughout biblical history, the poets have provided insightful commentary about the raw condition of the human heart revealing both the deepest fears and the highest aspirations of God's people. Each one of the five books of poetry takes us backstage to provide an authentic, intimate journal of how a fallen heart responds to a holy God. Each weekend throughout this summer, we're identifying one emotional state of mind that exposes our humanity. And so today couldn't be more appropriately titled than the, the title Confusion, because that's what I have been. For the past couple of weeks, trying to wrap my mind around how do we articulate and express the thoughts from the book of Job, 42 chapters of, of just information covering some of the, the greatest things that are of great importance to us in our humanity. Where, is, where does human suffering come from? Why do things happen in our lives that we can't control? What's the purpose? So those ethically deep waters, how do you communicate that in 35 or 40 minutes? And my answer to you is you don't, because we won't be able to thoroughly cover the book of Job. But what we can do today instead is really kind of focus our attention on one main idea, 
How does God want us to respond to him in our confusion? When we're confused, how should we come to God? What should we act like? How should we speak to him? These are the things that Job's going to give us some insight in. So I'm real excited to get there with you today. So first off, let's kind of define the term. When we say the word confusion, what do we mean? Things like a lack of clarity, being perplexed, uncertain. It's asking a lot of questions during that time. Things like why, how did this happen, where do I go from here? And the thing is about confusion, confusion isn't really a problem if, it's, if you're confused about something that doesn't matter to you. One of my neighbors, as I drive home, I looked in his garage one day, he has a large life-size cutout of Roger Rabbit in his garage. That really confuses me. But I really don't care. You might be confused the next time you pull up to the, the ATM, the drive through one at your bank, and you look at it and you realize it has Braille. Now that's confusing. And unless the person driving in front or behind you is blind and trying to use it for that purpose, you don't really care. So things can be confusing and it doesn't matter, but when they strike home, when confusion touches your life, touches the lives of people you love, affects your wellness, affects your circumstances, then you care a whole lot. Because confusion in itself isn't really the issue, it's the fact that confusion leads us to something else. Confusion is a state of mind, not an emotion, but confusion leads us to an array of emotions. Things like fear, anger, anxiety, embarrassment, apathy, to name a few. You might be confused about a situation, but it's when you turn the corner, that's what really matters because now you're confused and fill in the blank. And the problem is, in your life and mine, we see again and again that we make a whole lot of regrettable choices in the midst of our confusion. Take a look. Man, you know, that is a tough thing. And the worst part of all to me is the lawn gnome that gets run over. I mean, those things are irreplaceable. That's horrible. You can relate. You've made some really bad choices, sinful choices, when you've been confused. And that's what we want to look at today from the book of Job. How can we learn about how God wants us to respond to him in our confusion? So number one in your notes, if you're confused, you're not alone. If you're confused, you're not alone. If you've been through a season where you don't know which side is up and the circumstances that have come into your life, let me tell you, welcome to the human race. You are now one of us. We have such a limited vantage point, such a limited understanding of what comes into our lives and why and for what purpose and how and on the list goes. And if you've been on the planet for very long, you've been here. Not just confused for a few moments, but confused for days and weeks and months. So this is something that is very much a part of what it is to be human. Let me give you the stage for where Job finds himself in confusion. If you're reading with us in Ruth 66, we read Job chapters 1 and 2 this week. Chapter 1's begin with God and Satan coming and having an audience with him. And we're introduced to the man Job. Job is this man that is so um, interested and concerned about obeying God and honoring him with his life that even for his children, when they would have a time of a feast, Job would go out the next day and he'd offer sacrifices, sin offerings on their behalf just in case they would have sinned in their revelry. 
That's how concerned he was about having purity in his home and in his life. And Satan comes before God and God says, have you noticed Satan as you've been out and about my servant Job, the way he responds and lives towards me? And Satan says, well, for no wonder, God. Look what you've done to him. You've made him incredibly wealthy. You've blessed him with ten children. You've given him everything he wants. Who would not respond to you in obedience if he had what Job has? But you take away what he has, and he will curse you to your face. God says, okay, let's see. I'm going to show you that you're wrong. You can take everything away from Job, just don't take his life. Satan does. And the next few verses we read in Job chapter 1 is a messenger comes running up and says, Job, this, kind of, this grouping of your livestock have all been taken away. Every servant killed. I'm the only one who was left. I came to tell you. As the words are coming out of his mouth, another servant comes running up. Job, this other degree of your livestock, which in that day wealth was measured in, they're all gone. All your servants killed. I'm the only one. And servant after servant, while the other one is finishing up his thoughts, come and tell Job, Job, what you have is now gone. And the worst news of all is the last servant who comes and says, Job, your ten children were together celebrating. The house, the roof fell down. They're all dead. I'm the only one who lived to come and tell you this news. Calamity upon calamity upon calamity, literally within a few moments. I can't even begin to think how I would respond, yet look at the words of Job. Job chapter 1, verses 20 and 22 at this. Hearing this last messenger, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell down to the ground in spite. No, that's not what it says. He fell down to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. I don't know how you respond that way to that kind of loss and tragedy. There's a second conversation that Satan and God have, and Satan comes back to God, and God said, did you notice Job? Did you notice his response to what I allowed you to do in his life? Satan says, yeah, but you didn't let me touch his body. You can take everything away from a human being, but you take his body, take his health. Man, he's going to curse you to your face, God, and God says, I'll show you that you're wrong. You can have his body, just don't kill him. And Satan goes back and the Bible tells us in Job 2 that his body is afflicted with boils head to toe. It hurts so bad that he's out on a pile of ashes taking a piece of pottery and just simply cutting on himself to relieve the pain. And the Bible tells us that in all of this, Job did not sin. Man, I'm blown away. I read about that kind of response to suffering and I don't know how you do that. And the question for you and the question for me today is, but what do you do? What do you do when circumstances come into your life that you are confused by, you are baffled by, you are perplexed? What do you do with it? Do you go and tell everyone who'll listen? That phrase, misery loves company, is pretty true. Or maybe you bottle it all up inside and you're not going to tell anybody and the seeds of bitterness begin to grow, take root in your heart. Or maybe you do what Job did. Maybe you go to God and talk to him about it. So I want to give you permission of something that some of you have maybe never known, never encountered, or never walked into before. In your notes, you can express. You can express your confusion to God. You see, I love this about God. I love that God is not intimidated by your questions. I love that God is not somehow put off because you doubt what he's doing in your life. God is big enough, strong enough, and if we read through the the chapters of Job, as we read through the Psalms, as we read later the minor prophet Habakkuk, questions, God, where are you? God, what have you done? If there's any testimony from Scripture, you have that same permission to come to God in the same way and say, God, I don't get it. Help me understand. This is the stuff of the Bible. God invites you to come to him in your confusion and ask him about it. But here's the problem. 
most often you're asking all the wrong questions. Most often you're asking all the wrong questions. In your confusion, you and I so often, we ask all the wrong questions for what we want to know. In your confused and hurting state, most often you're so consumed with the why. Why me? Why them? Why now? Those are the things that just pulsate within us. So many of us are people who love to connect the dots in our lives. I want to be able to see how this connects to this connects to this. And there's so many gaps in your story that you just feel so flustered and frustrated. So you've had things come into your life. You're here today and the confusion that mounts may go all the way back to the family that you were raised in. God, why did you have me grow up in that home? It may relate to situations that have come into your life related to an accident that has had lifelong debilitating results in your life or someone close to you. Maybe it's a health-related issue that was discovered and now you're walking through deep water or your loved one is walking through places you've never been. You've heard about it happening to other people, but now it's happened to you and you say, God, why? I wanted you to know today that Job asked similar questions. You're not alone in wondering why. Listen to the real raw words, the raw heart of Job. In Job chapter 7, verse 20, listen to these words. He says, if I have sinned, what have I done to you? These are words directed at God. He's having a conversation, a dialogue with God. What have I done to you, you who sees everything we do? Why have you made me your target? Ever felt like that? Ever felt like you have this big red and white bullseye on the back of your back and as though God is unleashing arrows at you? Thing after thing comes in. You, you're very afraid to ask the question, how could it get any worse? Because you asked that yesterday and it did. God, I feel like I'm your target. If you've ever felt that way, Job did as well. Job chapter 13, verse 24 he writes, why, God, why do you hide your face and consider me your enemy? God, I feel like we're adversaries and you're after me and I am no match for you. Even at some of the depths where Job really went down to, Job chapter 10, 18, why then? Why then did you bring me out of the womb? A stillborn Job is better than a Job who's gone through what I've gone through, God. I wish I had died before an eye saw me. Man, these are powerful. And you're here today and you resonate a bit with them. You go, yeah, I've actually asked things like that. I've wondered things like that in my spirit, in my season of confusion. See, as you've been reading the book of Job, you realize that Job has this profound interest in his single ambition becomes understanding the why. All of the loss, all of the tragedy, all of the hurt seems to take a second seat to why, God, you need to explain to me what you're doing. And he moves over this line from asking why to demanding why. From posing the question, God, why are you doing this, to now demanding, God, give me an account a detailed summary of why you have allowed these things into my life. And if you've been deep in confusion before, you may have crossed that same line. From what is a healthy conversation to God to what is a sinful tone with Him. Because the moment that you begin demanding of God, the moment that you begin expecting that He is going to give you a detailed account of what He's doing, you have forgotten who is God and who is not. Job struggled with this. As you're reading Job, you're seeing this chapter after chapter. And what I want to share with you today is this, that there are better, there are far more productive questions than asking why. Questions like what? What does God want to teach me through this experience? What does God want to teach me through the confusing circumstances that I'm in? This is a much better question the Apostle Paul, when he was struggling with what he defined as a, a thorn in his flesh, he doesn't give us the exact specific issue, but this concept is just so unbearable, so difficult. Listen to what he finally turned the corner from asking the why to something else. 2 Corinthians 12, three times, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
Therefore, as a result, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight, I welcome difficulty, weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions. For when I am weak, what? Then I am strong. Paul got over the why of this particular confusing situation he was in and began to ask God the what. And God was happy to reveal that to him. What do you want me to learn? Paul, I want you to learn that my power is best shown through you when you're at your weakest point. And Paul embraces that reality and says, well, God, good. I want your power to shine through me. When I'm weak, then I am strong. God, what do you want to teach me is a great question. Number two, how? How can my trust in God in the middle of my confusion be influential in the lives of the people in my oikos? Not why, but how. How, God, can this be influential as I trust you in the middle of what I'm confused by? So you may be here today and you go, man, I, I love Pastor Tom did such a great job last week unpacking the story of Esther and causing us to think through this oikos lens of these relationships and the opportunities for such a time as this. And so many of you are here today and you say, I'm willing to be that world changer, Todd. I want to be a source of encouragement in my relational world. We talk about it every weekend, your oikos. The people that God has supernaturally, strategically placed you in a sphere of influence. They see your life. They know you. And you said, God, I, I'll be willing to be a source of encouragement to that oikos. God, I'm willing to be a, a, an agent of grace in their lives. God, I want to be a source of truth when they're confused and they have questions. But have you ever wondered... If the most powerful thing that God would want to use you, the way that God would most want to amplify himself through your life, is bringing you through a confusing season where you demonstrated consistently, I don't know what's going on, but I'm trusting the God who does. Has that ever crossed your mind? That might be God's specific strategy to use you in the lives of others that you've been praying for and concerned about for years. See, Paul embraced that. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 16, he and Silas and some other companions were there ministering in the city of Philippi when out of the blue they're thrown into jail for completely no criminal charges at all. Just proclaiming the name of Jesus. And in this Philippian jail, man, they could have had all these questions. God, how are you going to, how are you going to use us to spread the gospel in Philippi when we're sitting in jail? God, what is going on with our future? God, you could liberate us. You could save us. Where are you? Those could have been the things flooding their minds, but the Bible teaches us in Acts 16, they were having a worship session. They're singing songs in jail and saying, God, you are great. God, you are an amazing God no matter what situation we may be in. And in the middle of that worship session in jail, an earthquake shakes the prison. We live in California. We understand how those come out of the blue. And boom, this earthquake is shaking the jail. The doors fly open. Every prisoner now available to leave. And as the Philippian jailer comes into the jail and takes assessment, sees all the doors open, he unsheaths his sword and he's about to kill himself because he knows that if any prisoner gets free, his life is on the line and he'll lose it for that. He takes his sword and is about to kill himself and Paul yells out, wait, wait, nobody has left. Everyone is here, you're fine. The jailer puts down his sword and over the course of a conversation, ultimately utters these amazing words to Paul. Paul, what must I do to be saved? I've watched you trust God in the middle of your difficult circumstances. I'm drawn to do the same. God wants to use you in people's lives. What if he wants to use you this way? How do you want to do that, God, rather than why? Number three, who? Who? Questions like who? Who will I be able to help someday because of the confusion I'm walking through now? Who will I be able to help someday because of the confusion I'm walking through now? 
Man, I've got to tell you, and some of you who have seen God walk you through confusing times, you have experienced this reality, that later on in your life, someone comes across your path, either from your oikos or even somewhere completely out of the blue, and they're going through something similar to what you've gone through, and you're able with a unique kind of empathy, be there and be able to comfort them. I can't tell you how many times in the course of my just life in ministry that I'm counseling with an individual or counseling with a couple, counseling with a family. And I always begin with this, this issue of paint me a picture, tell me what's going on and let's see how I can be helpful to you. And as they begin to do that, I literally could not tell you how many times the picture that they're painting has unique things in common with my life. With the seasons of confusion that God has walked me through. And though I don't express it on my face, in my spirit, there's just a smile. Because I realized, God, when I was screaming out why, all along, the better question was who? Who am I going to come in contact with someday? And I've got to tell you that when I, when I hear their story, my first words are never, I know what you're going through. Because I don't. I don't specifically walk in their shoes and know enough of their story, but there's some striking similarities. And I can tell them about the things that God has taught me when I was in a similar place. The Bible tells us that was going to happen. It's part of God's strategy. From 2 Corinthians chapter 1, this is the Apostle Paul again. This is how he starts the book. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles, so that, by the way, I've just learned to do this. I love purpose. I love the why. That's why this, is, this message and this topic is especially difficult for me. But I love that the Bible is so full of purpose statements like this one, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. God brings us through deep waters so that we could be able to be a source of comfort to others. That is powerful. And I can tell you, I know so many things of what not to do because of the situations I've been through in trying to comfort others. And I want to give you a, a couple heads up about that. A couple thoughts about how not to be helpful. Things you want to avoid. Things you don't want to do in the lives of people that are walking through a season of confusion. Because see, Job had really two problems. Number one, he had the weight of all of these trials and all these tragedies all at once. But then add to it the verbal barrage, the verbal ambush of what we'll find in the book of Job, these friends that are there with him, who one after the other continue to assault him with the idea that Job, nobody goes through this degree of suffering. Nobody has this kind of harsh reality unless they've done something horrible that deserves punishment. Job, you have sinned and you are lying. Confess so God can forgive you. They had a one-size-fits-all theology box that no suffering like this comes into a life unless it's deserved. The Bible teaches us that there is nothing that Job did to bring this upon himself. So Job has all of this going on throughout the book. And I'm here to tell you today that be careful. Be careful when you're going through times of confusion. I'm not saying not to share it with people, but be careful of bad counselors because Job sure had them and you may have them too. Understand in your notes that when it comes to people struggling with confusion, your words can either help or hurt them. When people are struggling with confusion, your words can either help or hurt them. What your words won't be is neutral. When somebody is in a fragile, emotional state, your words will not just be just white noise. They will mean something to that person, either to help or to hurt. So be careful, be thoughtful. So you want to tell you an interesting thing about Job's friends. We actually see in chapter 3 that as Job is sitting on this ash heap covered in boils, they come and sit with him for seven days. Seven days, the Bible teaches us, and they don't say a word. They don't say a word. And in your notes, that was actually the time when they were the most helpful, is when they were silent. They were most helpful in that situation when they were silent. 
They didn't need to defend God to the questions that Job was raising. They just needed to be there. I can't tell you, as people are walking through confusing times so often, they're asking questions that you can't even begin to put words to. And sometimes all they want to even do is vent. So simply being there, being present, being, having an arm to put around and hug, having a hand to hold, having a shoulder to cry on, with very little that needs to be said, sometimes that's the most helpful thing you can do. It would have been the most helpful thing that Job's friends could have done. To just let him dialogue with God, I don't get it. Man, I, I'm the kind of person like many of you, I'm, when I'm nervous, I just want to talk. I don't know what's coming out of my mouth. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I just learned to restrain my tongue. In the midst of that, those nerves, I just realized, Todd, you can do so much more damage. Just be quiet. Just be here. And that's going to be enough. That'll be helpful. How, how should we present ourselves? How should we be around people when they're going through difficult times? The Bible tells us in Colossians 3, clothe yourselves. Clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, and with patience. And bear with each other. Bear with each other. Be there for each other. I don't know if you have, you've been reading this week in the book of Job, if you've even just taken time to take stock. Like if you could just be watching Job and his friends sitting on a bench in a park and just listen to the conversation. Imagine the idea someone close to you has their wealth, their children taken all at once. They were not there. They had nothing to do with it. They had not sinned to somehow be a cause and effect reality. I do that in my life. I look at my life and I go, God, am I experiencing right now what I call self-inflicted pain? I have sinned against God. I've sinned against people and therefore I bear the consequences of it. But how many times do we go through situations that we honestly cannot pinpoint? I am suffering because I did. That's the kind of suffering Job's going through. And so imagine as you're watching that conversation, his friends are teaming up on him and saying, this has to be your fault. You had to do something to deserve this. There's no way God allows this degree of suffering without you doing something first to provoke him. I'm telling you, you don't need enemies when you have friends like that. Don't be that kind of friend. Lastly, what should our confusion do? In your confusion, God expects it to lead you to him. God expects your confusion to lead you to him. Do you remember those words uh, a couple weeks ago? We were looking at the narrative of King Jehoshaphat. And I love this narrative, and I love this king that just really, um, really recognized God's power in his life. And when he gets news, along with the people of Jerusalem, that there are three marauding nations, their armies are on their way, and they are so close that nobody can flee. We have no time to mount a resistance. We are just stuck. Remember the words he said on behalf of the people. Second Chronicles chapter 20, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And I remember reading that statement and just going, what, a, what an incredibly powerful statement of dependence, and statement of trust. We don't know what to do. We are completely at a loss. God, we're looking at you. It's not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of, oh, they're not even trying, they're just going to lay over. No, God, our best interest is all in your lap. We submit ourselves to you. See, this week as we looked at Job's story, Job contends again and again that he wants to have an audience with God. Contends again and again, God, this is actually what he uses. He uses legislative, legal language. And he says, God, I want to take you out of heaven and I want to throw you in the witness chair. And I'm going to be the prosecuting attorney and I'm going to answer, ask question after question and you're going to answer me. This is why you've allowed this into my life. Man, talk about crossing the line. Job did. Job forgot who was who in the equation. Job even at times challenges God's goodness and justice by what's happened to himself. But I will say this, in spite of what Job did wrong, you have to admit, no matter what, Job continued to go to God. 
trials and difficult circumstances and his confusion always led him back to the source of where answers may be. The source of where his strength could be. And that was with God. But so many times, how about for you? Does your confusion become a 180 degree run away from God because you're so frustrated and you're so hurt and you're so angry? I was a youth pastor for 10 years and I got to tell you that was probably one of the hardest parts of that job was dealing with students who so often were the collateral damage of things like a divorce or situations that came into their life they could not control and now they were sitting with it in their lap. But how many times did they run away from God, run away from his people, rather than look in the right places for answers? It broke my heart. What's wild about this narrative of Job is that he continues to look to God even though he doesn't understand what God's doing. And why do you think that? Why do you think that God wants our confusion to lead us to him? Well, if you're a parent, you understand this principle. How many times are you going to work with your kids when they're in circumstances that you can't even fix, you can't solve for them, but when they come to you, they come to you in their confusion and they say, Mom, Dad, I don't know what to do. You say, hey, I understand that. And I don't even have all of it solved for you or figured out for you, nor could I, but I can help you with the next step. Come to me. Those were the exact words that Jesus had when he was reflecting on the way that God had revealed himself to, of all people, the, the children. Jesus says to the crowd that's listening to him that day in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me. Come to me. Go to God in your confusion. Tell him that you don't understand and how you feel lost and how you don't know where to go. These are the conversations that he welcomes. This is the dialogue he invites you to have with him. And in closing today, I want to give you a couple thoughts from just my experience. I look back over my life and I realize two important truths that I can see clearly now about what has happened. What was it like going through seasons of confusion? Number one, God was there the whole time. God walks through deep waters with us. And that's one of those promises. They begin back in, in the Old Testament and especially in Joshua. They finish in Revelation. All throughout the Bible, God consistently says, a promise you can hang your hat on, you can take it to the bank, I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. I'm here. And if you're in a season of confusion today and you've doubted that, you've said, God, I don't know where you are. Can he give you a great assurance no matter how you feel? The Bible says he's not left you. And he's right there with you in the middle of it. The second thing I've realized is this, that looking back over the course of my life and having walked with God through these seasons, now I'm able, in some instances, in some cases, I'm able to connect the dots as to why. Why God allowed this thing so that thing could happen. And you have had some similar experiences, some similar just revelations. And the reason why is that we love that. It, that's what makes a movie a great movie when something really difficult happens at the beginning and these kind of plot lines end with something even better happening. As a result of this tragedy, this triumph takes place. You love those. I look back in my life and one of the notable ones comes to my mind related to a, uh, my time as a youth pastor. We took students up to winter camp uh, from where I was in Lancaster for winter camp. And so uh, we went up to Hume Lake. And so the first week we'd always take junior hires and the second weekend we'd take high schoolers. Well, weekend number one, one of our friends was coming up to drive the bus home, drive our kids home, named Bill, bus driver Bill. And literally as soon as Bill got on the property at Hume Lake, he gets out of his car and he slips on some ice and he lands on his back in such a way that he's not driving anyone anywhere for seven hours. He is out. And that's Monday morning, we're leaving in just a few minutes, and I don't have a bus driver. I don't have a license, I don't have a clue how we're getting these 45 kids home. 
So I am frantically running around the camp trying to beg someone to be a bus driver, and I'll take their word for it, if they say they are, uh, just to get us home. And as I'm looking all around, one of the things I, I happen into is a meeting where a church was having this debrief session about what the weekend was like for them. And I, and I kind of interrupted their meeting, but I thought, that's a cool idea. I've never done that before. Um, by the way, I need a bus driver. And then I had to take off. So I'm frantically find, looking for a bus driver. God totally connects the dots. Uh, a guy up at the camp was able to drive us down to Bakersfield. One of our church bus drivers came and met us there and drove us the rest of the way home. I go, oh, God, thank you. But I got to tell you, man, throughout that next week, I was scratching my head. God, why would you bring Bill all the way up to Hume Lake just to slip when he got out of the car? Like, that's crazy. What was that all about? Well, the very next weekend, we go to camp, take high schoolers this time. And that debrief idea stuck in my mind. And God had done so many cool things over the weekend where students had placed their faith in Christ from our group for the first time. It was just this great celebration. But I pulled everyone aside and said, let's do this debrief in one of these rooms before we go. And as we got there, one of the first people to say anything was Jill. And Jill was going to be a junior or a senior. I remember her saying, man, I've been introduced to this idea of who Jesus is this week, and it's, it's, it's just mind-boggling. I don't know what to do. I, I don't know what to do next. And so we took some time, and just in that group of 80, we prayed, God, would you give Jill just what the next step is in her life? We took some time to pray for her, and then other people went around sharing. And we got towards the end. We were getting ready to go, and Jill raised her hand again, and she said, I realize now what that next step is, even by listening to all of you. I, I need to have Jesus as my Savior. And out loud, in front of 80 people in this room, she prays to receive Christ. And I sat there, and I was just sitting, my, my soul was just flooded with joy. And, and it dawned on me while she's praying, hey, if I wouldn't have been looking for a bus driver last week, I would have never thought of this debrief idea. And who knows if Jill would have ever come to that point where she realized in that community, I need Jesus. And I said, God, thank you. I got home and told Bill, Bill, I know why you fell on the ice. <laughs> he kind of grimaced a smile, oh, good. I've had those moments when I can connect the dots. And you may have too. But I would be completely wrong if I let you go without telling you first, for every one of those stories, there are 25 others that I have no idea. God, what are you doing? God, why? How? What? I want to present that very real tension that we live in this side of heaven where we don't always get the why and even sometimes seldom do. But the reality is, when will you embrace that truth? You're not going to get it. And Job, when God comes to Job, finally at the end of Job, God comes to him and God doesn't come over to Job and say, Hey Job, uh, man, sorry about all that calamity. <laughs> it was wild. Are you doing okay? God comes to Job in the storm and in the thunder. And the very first words he says to Job, Job, brace yourself. These are not words you want to hear from God. <laughs> brace yourself like a man. And I'm going to ask you, and literally for four chapters, the last four of the last five chapters of Job is a barrage of literally sarcastic questions from God, which almost seem insult to injury, but they're not. Because God says, Job, where were you? When I set up the foundations of the earth, tell me how I marked out the dimensions. Tell me what I was doing. How can you possibly understand, as a finite human being, what I'm after and what I'm doing when I've done all of this? In the text, we never read that God ever tells Job the why. We never read that Job ever has insight into the conversation that Satan had with him. But this conversation with God was enough. These are Job's last words from Job 42.5. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job realizes that God is God, and he is not. And when you can embrace 
the truth of that statement, then your mantra, the next time you go through a season of, of, of confusion, maybe even right now, as you are in it, your words really can be those. Those last words in your notes, when you can't trace God's hand, trust his heart. When you can't trace God's hand, which is so often, trust his heart. This week, let your confusion lead you to God rather than out in the desert of self-pity and short-sightedness and bitterness. Let it lead you to God and find your strength and your hope in Him. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today. And God, we begin by just simply saying, forgive us. Forgive us for being so consumed with the why in our life. Why have you allowed? Why did this happen? Why was it me? God, we're so perplexed by these things. And for some of us, they have bogged us down for months, for years, for decades. We've been stuck in the why. God, help us surrender that to you today. Well, what a huge, huge red-letter day today would be. If in the midst of our confusion that has kept us from living lives that please you, because we, like Job, have demanded the why, would we give that up, set it aside, and ask better questions? God, what do you want to teach me? God, how do you want to use this as an influence? God, who? Who can I help? God, forgive us. And you may be here today and we talk about going to God in the midst of your confusion and you say, man, I would love to do that. I don't know how. I've never really had any kind of relationship with God to know how to talk to him or go to him. The great news is before you even leave this place, that can change. At HCC, we talk about the ABCs. A is admit. Admit that you are a sinner. Admit that you have lived life on your terms, not according to God's law. And there's not a single person in this auditorium who does not fit that bill. When we said earlier today, if, you're exper if you've experienced confusion, welcome to the human race, we say it the same way. If you are a sinner, welcome to the human race. That is what we are. But B, believe. Believe that what God did in sending his one and only son, where you could never make it right with God, God made a way for you to be right with him. Because of Jesus' sinless life, his sacrificial death, and his miraculous resurrection, 2,000 years ago, that covered the debt that you have with him today. You can be forgiven because Jesus bled on your behalf. But it's not just enough to know that C is to choose it. God doesn't ask for people who would know about him. He asks for people who would follow him. Bring your life to Jesus' cross and set it down. And say, God, I've made a mess of mine. I'm completely confused. But I want to give my life to you and see what you would want to do with it. I surrender. I follow you. Before you even get out of your chair, that can be your prayer today. And your life, like the people that you've heard, whose lives have been changed by Jesus, that can be your story too. Father, we love you and we're so very grateful for what you've done for us in Christ. And we pray because of his awesome name today. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next weekend.